So good afternoon. This is lecture nine of the course using vector calculus to solve problems in electricity and magnetism. My name is Dr. Richardson. Um, my email address is listed as above. And just some administrative issues. Again, learning is not a passive activity. Please take notes throughout the course. I'm just sitting back and watching me right on the black on the whiteboard. It's not an effective way to learn anything. You need to do the problems in the problem sets. So as of last Monday, the solution key to uh, problem set uh, eight was posted. Um, sorry, uh, pro uh, as of last Monday, problem set eight was posted. The solution key to problem set eight will be available um, tomorrow. It probably is actually already up um, at the normal site in Google Drive. Problem set nine, that'll be posted probably no later than uh, Tuesday. Again, you should work the problems independently. You can read the solutions to these problems anywhere in the universe. These are problems that have been done, but you're not gonna learn anything by just looking, just jumping to the solutions. And again, even when you get the solutions, don't read them thoroughly. Just try to take a piece of paper and cover and go down them line by line, see if you can get a hint on when, where you got lost in doing a problem. That way you're gonna learn the material. Certainly you're encouraged to ask questions. I'm available by email um, uh, anytime during the week and on the weekends. Um, and it's probably helpful to have a ruler in taking notes and actually doing problems because you really will need to draw, as you see in lecture, lots of diagrams to show what's going on. Okay, so we've been looking at the problem of calculating the electrostatic potential. What is the electrostatic potential? Well, formally, you get it by taking a line integral of the electric field over some path. We'll say a little bit more about this path business next time. And the electric field and the display, the electric field, E, and the displacement uh, vector. These are both vectors, so when you dot them, you get a scalar. So the electrostatic potential is an example of an electrostatic uh, vector, is, a, is an example of a, a scalar field. Now, we actually, last time in lecture six, used this expression and Gauss's law to calculate the electrostatic potential for a couple of examples. And these examples were very special because they had symmetry that allowed you to compute or evaluate the electric field and then just do this line integral to get the electrostatic potential. So these examples had very high symmetry. When we first define the electrostatic potential, we talked about it for the simple example of an isolated point charge, Q. Where again, this distance is in the denominator. So this is the electrostatic potential for an isolated point charge. And we looked at two examples last lecture, one for a single isolated point charge and one for two separate isolated point charges. So if you have a continuous charge distribution, the electrostatic potential can be computed by just doing an integral. Now, the beauty of this is that the electrostatic potential is simply the result of an integral. There are no vectors in the integral. There are no unit vectors, okay? And once you get this result, the scalar potential, you can always find the electric field for that system by just taking minus the gradient of the electrostatic potential. So the electrostatic potential is a very neat way to calculate the electric field. 
And as we saw last lecture and we'll see today, and you'll see in problem set nine, this method is far easier than calculating the electric field by doing a full-blown interval. It looks like this that has a unit vector r hat in the numerator. Okay. So this afternoon we want to go through some more examples of finding the electrostatic potential. And in fact, we don't have to really hunt too far to find examples. All we have to do is go back to look at previously discussed examples. Namely, suppose you have a uniformly charged sphere whose radius is A. You can set this problem up to calculate the electrostatic potential for distances greater than the radius of the sphere. And that's a problem or an example we'll do in a minute. The next problem we're going to do is go back and look at that same charge sphere But this time we're gonna look inside the sphere. So we're gonna look at distances less than A. So case one is we're looking outside the sphere to calculate the electrostatic potential. And case two, we're gonna look at a situation where we wanna see what's going on inside the sphere. We'll come back to this point, but once you have these two answers to get the electric, the electric field, all you have to do is take minus the gradient of the results. Differentiation is always easier than integration. And then the final example we're going to look at this afternoon is that of a finding the electrostatic potential for a uniformly charged disk of radius A along its axis. And the actual geometry for this problem will be clearer when we set it up, once we set it up. Okay, so let's start. So let's first look at the case of a charged sphere. Of radius A. So we stand the reason that it's a very useful thing to do if we in fact exploit the spherical symmetry of the problem. And specifically, if we use spherical polar coordinates. So this sphere has a radius A. It's uniformly charged. So I can take a differential volume element, dV, and it will generate an electric field everywhere. But in particular, I just want to look at the electric field at this point. I'll call this point P. Since I'm going to use spherical polar coordinates, let me define all the things that I'll need to use. I'll drop a perpendicular line from the differential volume element down to the x, y plane. So that will define an angle phi. The distance from the origin to the differential volume element, I'll call r prime. And the angle 
that r prime makes with the z-axis is my polar angle. And I'm going to use a convention where prime variables refer to the source charge distribution. Now, I could always do that. I have not always do that, done that heretofore, but it's useful to do that here so we don't have any, we avoid the risk of any confusion with other variables we introduce into the problem. Okay, so I think we're ready to go. The question is, what is V at P, point P? where P is a point greater than A. So R is that distance between the differential volume element dV and the point P. So I have all of my variables for the problem. So, to calculate the electrostatic potential, I have to do an integral over volume, dQ divided by four pi epsilon naught, R. dQ, small piece, differential piece of charge, is just going to be the volume charge density. Note that I'm doing this problem in spherical polar coordinates, so there's no possibility of confusion with the row that we saw for cylindrical polar coordinates times dV prime. And I know what this is. dQ is just rho times R prime squared sine theta prime d prime dV. So I have my numerator covered. The remaining thing I have to do is ask myself, what is R? Well, R is the distance between the differential volume element dV prime and point P, but I would like to express R in terms of other interesting uh, parameters in the problem, namely R prime, and Z. So let us extract from this figure a triangle that's going to show us immediately how R, Z, and R prime are all related. Go back and look at the figure. Z, R, and R prime are defined accordingly. And here's theta prime. And the law of cosines helps you out. The reason why the law of, co law of cosines is applicable here is that it's far more general than if this were a right triangle. This is not a right triangle. So the law of cosines tells us that R squared is a Z squared plus R prime squared minus, let's clean that up a bit, two R prime Z cosine theta prime, or that R is a Z squared plus r prime squared minus two r prime z cosine theta prime, the entire quantity raised to the one half power. 
So I really have everybody. I know what R is. So I can put that in the denominator of my integrand. And I know what uh, DQ is. It's just rho dv prime, which is just rho r prime squared dr prime sine theta prime d theta prime d phi prime. And go back and look at your notes. I may have dropped this D R prime, but I definitely need that. So, so by using the law of cosines and using spherical pole coordinates, I'm in a position now to at least formally set up how I would do my integral. So the electrostatic potential Let's pull out constants. There's a volume charge density. There's a, in the denominator four pi epsilon naught. Epsilon naught is permittivity of free space. I have to do an integral over a volume. The numerator has an r prime squared d r prime sine theta prime d theta prime d phi prime and the the numerator has that. The denominator is z squared plus r prime squared minus 2 r prime z cosine theta prime. And that entire quantity is raised to one half power. So what are my variables in this integral? My variables are r prime, theta prime, B prime, and there's only one constant in the problem, and that's Z, because I want to calculate the electrostatic potential at a particular point Z. Z is greater than the radius of the sphere. So first things first, this integral looks complicated. It doesn't look complicated. It is complicated. But I can integrate out the um, azimuthal angle, phi, because nothing else depends upon it in the integrand. So that pulls out a factor of 2 pi. So I'm left with rho divided by 2 epsilon naught. And my double, in, my triple integral now becomes a double integral. I have an enumerator r prime squared, d r prime sine theta prime d theta prime. So the numerator gets a little more simpler to deal with. The denominator is still the same. Okay. Now, the next task, so first I did the, the polar integral. And that was easy. So there's no phi prime dependence anymore. Next, I'm going to do the azimuthal angle interval. And this is a little bit more challenging. So let me remind myself what that is. I'm going to take this denominator and attempt to simplify it a bit by changing variables. I'm going to let u equal z squared plus r prime squared minus 2r prime z cosine theta. Now, when I do
when I perform the polar integration, you go back and look at your figure and we do it over theta prime, it's important to realize that r prime is fixed. Just over that polar integration, r prime is not fixed in general in the problem, but when I do the polar integral over theta prime, it's a fixed, it can be treated as a, uh, as a constant. So that's actually going to help me in simplifying this integral because if I go and take the derivative of u, du, z is a constant and over the polar integration, theta prime is a constant. So du just becomes two r prime z sine theta prime d theta or sine theta d theta becomes one over two r prime z du. And this is key. So I have a way of simplifying and getting rid of that sine theta d theta term in the numerator by just recasting it in terms of a dummy variable u. So let's go back. Remember where we started? We said the electrostatic potential was a volume charge density divided by four pi epsilon naught. Let's write the entire numerator, r prime squared dr prime sine theta prime cosine there's no cosine there sorry d theta prime there's a z over there's a z squared plus r prime squared minus two r prime z cosine theta prime all raised to the one half power I've done the azimuth uh, integration. So that numerator is just two epsilon naught. And I've defined a dummy variable u. It's z squared plus r prime squared minus two r prime z cosine theta prime du is to r prime z sine theta prime d theta prime and the sine of theta prime d theta prime in terms of this new dummy variable du is simply du divided by two r prime z so this follows from the fact that this follows from the fact that R primed is fixed over the data prime integration. So what do you get out of all of this? Well, what you get is a way to get rid of this part of the numerator. You don't get rid of it, but you replace it by something simpler and you do the same thing for the denominator. And again, remember the goal, we're trying to do this integral, which in fact is now a double integral. Okay, so what does this integral become? 
the electrostatic potential now simplifies to rho divided by two epsilon naught comes outside and I have a one over two r prime z du over the square root of u r prime squared d r prime. So I have two variables of integration, u and r prime. And this integral certainly looks a lot simpler than the previous one. So let's integrate over u first. So remember, what is u? It's a dummy variable we introduced. It's z squared plus r prime squared minus 2 r prime z cosine theta prime. I can, when I do a change in variables, I need to change the limits of integration also. And remember u, what we're doing in integrating over u is we are doing the integral over the polar angle, theta prime. So theta prime goes from zero to pi. If I use this change in variables formula, that's a formal way of calling this thing, but that's what it is. It tells you how to go from u to theta prime. Then u is just going to be z minus r prime squared. You can see immediately when theta prime is zero, cosine of theta prime, theta prime is one. And this expression has three terms that can be uh, merged into this sim simplified in terms, in terms of this, this expression, z minus r prime squared. Similarly, when theta prime is pi, cosine of pi is minus one. So it's easy to show that here you'll get z plus r prime squared. So those are the lim limits of integration for you. Okay, so let's continue. So, my electrostatic potential, I'm gonna pull out all the constants in the problem. Z and epsilon naught are certainly constants. And I now have an integral of u to the minus one half power du. I have an inner integral and I have an outer integral. And that outer integral involves r prime dr prime. So let us do the inner integral first. It's going to be, I'll keep my constant here, rho divided by two, rho divided by four epsilon naught z. Make that look like a four. And I'm going to integrate u to the minus one half power du. And u is going to have a lower limit of integration of z minus r prime squared and an upper limit of integration of z plus r prime squared. So you can do that integral. And what you'll get is rho divided by two epsilon naught z of a quantity in brackets. One involves the square root of z plus r prime squared. And the other involves the square root of z minus r prime squared. So 
this is my zero is what I started out originally. I have an inner integral as well as an outer integral. The inner integral goes over u, the outer integral goes over r prime. I do the inner integral first and I get a result that just depends upon r prime. So that's not um, an accident. And in principle, what I can do is then take two, plug it back into the original integral, which now goes down to a simpler integral over r prime. So I started out with a volume integral, turned that into a two-dimensional integral, and finally I have a one-dimensional integral. Okay, so let's hold up for a minute. I've got square roots here. And I need to be a little cautious in evaluating these square roots. So what am I talking about? So if I give you a quantity W and I square it, and I ask you to take its square root, or let's do it in the context of what we've been talking about. Formally, mathematically, this thing has two answers, plus or minus w. And mathematically, there's no distinction between the two. Physically, when you look at problems, it's useful because of physical reasons, just to choose the positive square root so that you get an answer that makes sense. And we're going to do that in this problem. That answer that we got previously involved two square roots. One was the square root of z plus r prime squared. The other is the square root of z minus r prime squared. So the first term is pretty straightforward. We're going to take its positive square root. And it's just, just simply that. The second one, we are going to take its positive square root, but we have to realize that we are trying to solve this problem for positions or points outside of the sphere. And if you go back and look at the physical picture of this charged solid sphere, z, any point outside the sphere, is always greater than r prime. So it makes perfect sense since z is greater than r prime outside the sphere to use that as our way of evaluating these two square roots. Okay, this is a very important point. Okay. Okay, so in principle, I'll say this again. Mathematically, when you take a square root of a quantity, you have an option of taking a positive value or a negative value. When you look at the problem in the context of a physical application, nine times out of 10, it's, it's probably more useful to take the positive square root. You can do that here in examples one and two, and there's physical meaning, especially in two, because you're looking for the electrostatic potential outside the sphere, or you're looking for cases where Z is always greater than R prime. So the square root of Z minus R prime squared is always plus Z minus R prime for this case, when you're looking outside the sphere. Okay, so let's put all this together. The electrostatic potential I know is going to just depend upon Z. There will be a constant 2 epsilon naught Z that I'll pull outside. And once I evaluate those square roots, my integrand becomes a lot easier. to dispense with. I have an integrand of z minus r prime minus z plus r prime, all in square brackets, multiply that by r prime. And 
I want to do this integral over R prime. R prime starts with zero and it ends at the radius of the sphere, A. So I have an integral that looks much easier than the original integral I've dealt with. So this, I maintain, is an elementary integral. You can evaluate it. And it turns out to be rho times a cubed divided by 3 epsilon naught z. So you need to check this. One thing you can check immediately are the dimensions. The volume charge density, after all, has to go like charge over meters cubed. A cubed goes like meters cubed, and Z goes like a length. So my final result is going to go like charge over length, and that, those are the correct units for the electrostatic potential. I will leave it up to you to find that you can rewrite this expression, not in terms of, or you can rewrite this expression in terms of the total charge of the sphere. And you should get a result. That's not surprising. you get a result that's the same as an isolated point charge at the origin. And exploiting the symmetry of the problem, you can replace the Z by R, and you definitely get an expression that you know and love, the electrostatic potential of the point charge. So off, after all that integration, end of the day, I get a result that's simple. And more importantly, it's a result that I know is correct. So my uh, a sphere of radius A that has a uniform charge distribution rho. Rho, of course, is charge divided by volume, and that's 4 thirds pi A cubed. There's a three upstairs in the numerator. This allows you to turn this expression into this. Finally, um, once you have an electrostatic potential, you really want to get the electric field. So it's easy to show that it is exactly what you expect it to be. It is Q over four pi epsilon naught R squared times an R hat in the numerator. And again, all of this is true for points outside the sphere. And that's where you were asked to solve the problem. Okay. So, now, I will make the following comment. If you go back and look at problem set six, I believe. I asked you in problem set six to calculate the electric field outside. So let's write this. So in problem set six, you were asked to find the electric field outside a sphere of uniform volume charge density rho
and radius A. And in fact, if you go back and look at that problem, I'll make the following statement, that that problem actually is the hardest problem of the course. Even though there are more problems to come, that problem will definitely be the hardest part of the course. And so it was so difficult that in fact, I gave you lots of clues and actually worked through lots of the steps and just left some of the elementary uh, calculus for you to fill out. So the point here is that that problem is extremely hard to do. But the problem that we just did of calculating the electrostatic potential outside of a spherical charge of volume A and then taking the gradient of that minus the gradient of that to get the electric field. You may not believe this, but this is actually much easier to do. So what we've done before today is much easier than the original problem back in problem set six. And to see that, go back and look at that. Okay, so the next example we want to look at is the same system. We're going to have a uniformly charged spherical object, a sphere. We should go to a red alert. We know we're going to use spherical polar coordinates. We know that this sphere has a radius A. But now we want to find the electrostatic potential inside the sphere. So we want R to be less than A. So let's at least set this up. DV prime is my differential volume element. Here's my x-axis and my y-axis. We're all experts in spherical polar coordinates. So there's going to be a vector that goes from the origin to the differential volume element, dv. Again, let me use my uh, convention, dv prime. We'll call that r prime. r is going to be the distance between dv prime and a point on the z-axis. But note that that point is inside the sphere. So there's R, Z, R, and, and R prime. This is my normal theta prime. I drop a perpendicular down to the X, Y axis. Perpendicular line down to the X, Y axis. And that allows me to define theta prime. So the formalism is still the same. I have to start from the beginning. The beginning is the beginning. And in many ways, starting this problem is going to be very similar to what we did in the previous case. DQ, which I need to evaluate from the numerator, is rho dv prime. dv prime is simply going to be r prime squared dr prime sine theta prime d theta prime d phi prime. And I'm going to need the law of cosines to help figure out how R, R prime, and Z are related. And so far, we're not, we haven't done anything that's different from the previous example. R is going to be the quantity z squared plus r prime squared minus 2r prime z cosine theta prime, all that to the one half power. So again, I have a recipe or a formula for evaluating the numer numerator of this volume integral, and I have a recipe or formula for calculating the denominator of this integral. And this, of course, is a volume interval. But I have to recognize that at some point 
some stage of this problem, I'm going to have to come to grips with the observation. I want to get an answer that's only true for R less than A. Okay, so I can set this up. And then after that, the rest is just calculus, right? So the electrostatic potential is going to depend upon Z. There's going to be a rho divided by 4 pi epsilon naught as a constant prefactor. There's going to be a volume integral of R prime squared, dr prime, sine theta prime, d theta prime, d phi prime in the numerator. And my denominator will have a quantity z squared plus r prime squared minus 2 r prime z cosine theta prime to the 1 half power. So I'm going to save myself some time. I'm going to do use the same steps that I did before. I will do the azimuthal angle first. Maybe I'm going to integrate over phi prime because it doesn't appear anywhere in the integrand. This is a volume integral. Next, I'm going to do the polar integral, integral over theta prime. So it's not the azimuthal angle I'm doing, it's the uh, azimuthal integral that I'm going to do first. Then I'm going to do the polar integral over theta prime, where R prime is fixed during this integration. I mean, that's just a fact. You just go back and look at the diagram. When you integrate over the polar integral theta prime, you're doing it for fixed values of R prime. I'm not saying that R prime is always fixed. I'm just saying that when you, when you do the polar integral over theta prime and doing that particular integral, R prime can be treated as a constant. So again, same recipe, change of variables. I'm going to set u equal to z squared plus R prime squared minus 2 R prime z cosine theta prime. And it follows from fact 2 that in fact, the sine of theta prime, d theta prime, is just going to be du divided by 2 r prime z. So this, this approach is exactly the same as the previous example. Note what you have is with the introduction of the dummy variable u, the denominator of this integrand simplifies. You certainly can get rid of the phi dependence, phi prime dependence, by doing the azimuthal in, uh, uh, integral. And as far as the numerator of the integrand is concerned, the sine theta prime, the theta prime is going to be written in terms of constants, r prime and z, and my dummy variable, du. So I can put all this together. and get an expression for the electrostatic potential at a point Z. It's just going to be rho, the volume charge density, divided by 2 times the permittivity of free space. I'm going to have a double integral. i got to figure out what the limits of integration are, but first things first. I have a factor of 1 over 2 r prime Z, u to the minus 1 half du r prime squared dr prime. And if this looks familiar to you, it should, because it's exactly the same as in the previous case. Now, we will need to do this inner integral first. 
we'll get a result, we'll integrate out the view dependence. And then once we have that done, we can do the integral over the outer integral, r prime. Okay, same story. Remind you that u is z squared plus r prime squared minus two r prime z cosine theta prime. My azimuthal integral, sorry, my polar integral, theta prime is going to go from zero to pi. And I'll make, make a nice little table. So u is just going to be z minus r prime squared. And at theta, when theta prime is pi, it's going to be z plus r prime squared. All this is very similar to what we did before. So here comes the big difference. When I take these square roots to get the limits of integration, I'm going to use take positive square roots. So that's fine. Now, to take the square root of z minus r prime squared, I have a problem. Problem is, I want to take a positive square root. But I have to recognize, and this positive square root is going to depend upon z and r prime. But r prime has two possibilities. Go back and look at the figure. Since you're inside the sphere, r prime could be anywhere from zero to z, or r prime could be from z to the radius of the sphere, a. So there are two cases that you have to take into account. So this is where the problem goes off the road a bit, and it's a little bit more complicated in the previous case, where you were looking at the electrostatic potential outside the sphere. So you have to evaluate this guy for two separate cases. Let's do that. So you're going to get a result that you want to take the square root of. You want to take the square root of z minus r prime squared. And you want to make sure that this thing has a positive square root. Well, if r prime is less than z, then that square root is certainly z minus r prime. So you're OK. If, however, you're in the regime where r prime is greater than z, then you have to take the quantity of plus times r prime minus z. That follows immediately from the fact that you could write the square root of this quantity as just that. And again, I'm taking positive square roots. So I have two different regimes to worry about or I have two different integrals to worry about. When I evaluate that final integral for the electrostatic potential, one integral is going to go from zero to z of r prime dr prime to z plus r prime minus two times z minus r prime. Once you evaluate those square roots, and then you get a second integral. 
and that's going to look like rho divided by 4 pi epsilon naught. But the limits of integration for r prime here are from a to z. And the integrand is slightly different. It's 2 times z plus r prime squared minus 2 times r prime minus make that look a little bit more aesthetically pleasing, 2 times r prime minus z. Okay. So from here on in, all you have to do is evaluate these elementary integrals. z is a constant. It appears that it's the limit of integration, but it's a constant in both of these two integrals. a is certainly a constant. r prime is a variable. And so I will leave up to you in problem set nine, which will be available probably no later than Tuesday, that when you evaluate this integral or these two integrals and evaluate the electrostatic potential, you'll get the following expression. You'll get the result that the electrostatic potential depends upon z and it will have two terms rho divided by 2 epsilon naught a squared minus z squared divided by 3 So it's useful to ask yourselves, and again, this is true for distances z inside the sphere. So this expression looks a bit complicated, but like every other problem we've talked about in this course, one of the things you should do is look at limiting cases to see if this is an expression that you believe. So what are some limiting cases that will help you understand whether or not this thing is telling you the truth or not? Well, one limiting case you can look at, suppose you are at the surface of the sphere. So z equals a. And suppose you replace the volume charge density by q divided by 4 pi a cubed. And there is a three denominator. Volume charge density is q is charge per unit volume. So rho is just 3q divided by 4 pi a cubed. It is simple to show that once you make those assumptions, you'll get an expression for the electrostatic potential at the surface of the sphere, or the radius A, and that's Q over 4 pi epsilon naught A. So that makes sense. That's exactly the same thing you would get if you wanted to calculate the electrostatic potential of a point charge. Um, this is not a limiting case, but you can rewrite your answer in terms of the charge, total charge of the sphere. And again, the way to do that is to recognize that volume charge density is Q over volume. And in this case, it's Q divided by 4 pi A cubed, and there's a 3 in the numerator. And once you make that substitution, you should show that the electrostatic potential looks like q over 8 pi epsilon naught a times 3 minus z squared over a squared. Now, before we go any further in discussing these results, let's look at the units. This first expression, I have terms that go like a meter squared. My Volume charge density goes like coulombs over meters cubed. 
so my electrostatic potential is okay. It's gonna go like coulombs for meters. Same thing here, z squared over a squared is just dimensionless, right? Units disappear, meters squared disappear in the numerator and the denominator. And I'm left with something that goes like a coulombs per distance. So even though these expressions are complicated, they make sense dimensionally. So that's a good thing to do. So one of the things that you should do is in terms of a limiting case is several things you should do. Find out what happens in this expression when Z equals A. You'll get an expression for the, electro, the electrostatic potential as a function of Z. Or because of spherical symmetry, you can replace Z by R. And the other thing you should do is recognize that the electric field is just minus the gradient of the electrostatic potential. So you should find the electric field everywhere inside this system and see if the answer you get makes sense with what you know. Okay, these last couple of items, these limiting cases and tests, I'm gonna ask you to look at in problem set nine. And problem set nine is also a very useful vehicle for you to review to make sure you understand how to do these two problems. So we looked at a spherical charge diff distribution. of radius A and in fact this charge distribution had a was uniform it's constant and we've looked at in lecture nine two cases we looked at the case where we're outside actually this was Z right the sphere and we also looked at the case where we're inside the sphere, and that's a little bit more challenging. And what we were doing, or what we've done, is we found the electrostatic potential. Then what I want you to do in problem set nine is to find the electric field in these two cases. How do you do that? Well, once you have done the work in getting the electrostatic potential, life is easy. Just take minus the gradient of that electrostatic potential and that gives you the electric field. So again, I said in problem set six, we actually did the problem of the electrostatic field, we calculated E outside the sphere. And if you go back and look at this problem, it is, as I said, the most difficult or challenging problem in these series of lectures. So in fact, I didn't throw you into 60 feet of water without a life preserver. I actually led you through steps of how to do that problem. I maintain what we've done this afternoon by calculating electrostatic potential and then just taking the minus the gradient of that to get the electric field. It's a much easier task to do. I may, in a subsequent problem, so I may, in a subsequent problem set, give you the assignment of calculating the electric field for the region inside the solid sphere without the ladder or the protection or the security net of the electrostatic potential. And that's a hard problem. 
that's almost as hard as the case inside. Actually, it's actually formally it's actually harder than the case um, outside. But as we've shown this afternoon, if you go through the mechanism of calculating electrostatic potential, that's always going to be an easier task to do. So these two examples, I want you to explore further. Again, does you no good to sit back and watch me do this on the whiteboard? You have to roll up your sleeves, get into the dirt, get dirt on your fingernails, and see how this works. So as a third and final example, I'm going to look at the problem of a uniformly charged disk And this disk will have a surface charge density that's uniform. And it'll have a radius. A. So what do I want to do? In this problem, I want to find the electrostatic potential. And then once I have the electrostatic potential, I want to find the electric field. Now, those are very ambitious goals. Even those problems are difficult. So I'm going to restrict, make my problem much more easy to deal with by just asking the same questions at particular points in space of high symmetry. So that'll make the problem more tractable, more doable. Now, let me remind you, we have seen this problem before either in lecture or in, a or in a problem set. We have calculated the electrostatic field, electric field, due to a uniformly charged disk of radius A and uniform surface charge density. We're going to redo this problem. But we're going to redo this problem by calculating the electrostatic potential, which we'll claim is a much easier thing to do. So let's get started. So a couple of things to point out. Since I have a disk of radius A, I should not have to think too hard and long to recognize that cylindrical polar coordinates are going to help me in tackling this problem. So again, everything we've done before in this course is useful. One lecture builds upon the next. So I remind you what happens in uh, cylindrical polar coordinates. Here's a point P. And if I drop a line from point P down to the XY plane, I can define a vector from the origin to that point. Let's do, use our ruler so this is a little, point, a little bit more aesthetically pleasing. This distance is rho. This angle is phi, and this distance is z. So the point P being a vector is just rho, phi, z in cylindrical polar coordinates. So how does that germane to our problem? Well, here's our circular disk. So what I'm going to do is orientate it in space 
so that the z-axis points in that direction, the y-axis points in that direction, the x-axis points in that direction. I'm using a right-hand rule, of course. And I don't want, and this uh, charge disk has a radius A. It has a uniform surface charge density sigma. And I'm not asking the question of what is the electrostatic potential everywhere in space. I just, I just want to know the electrostatic potential at some point along the axis that goes through the center of this disk. And so in fact, I want to be able to draw a line from a differential surface element of the disk DS to some point Z where the distance from the origin to the differential surface element is Z. Uh, oh, sorry, not this coordinate system. So this distance is Z. In cylindrical polar coordinates, the distance between the origin and DS is rho. And Pythagoras will come along and tell you that the distance from ds to this point is rho squared plus z squared to the one half power. I'm here, so I might as well recognize it. I'm going to need to find an expression for the differential amount of charge dq of my circular disk. So that's going to be equal to a constant surface charge density, sigma times a differential surface element, ds. And in cylindrical polar coordinates, I know, excuse me, exactly what this is. It's rho d rho d phi. And if you want, the square root of rho squared plus z squared is simply r. So by just looking at this diagram, writing it down carefully, making sure I understand how to describe it according to a certain set of axes, I have the two things I'm going to need to calculate the electrostatic potential at a point along the z-axis. I have an expression for r, and I have an expression for dq. And now all I have to do is break this up into a problem involving calculus. I'll say this and I'll leave this for you to figure out since we talked about this oh many moons ago, probably lecture three, problem set three. You could do this problem by breaking the uniformly charged disk into angular rings and the angular rings would have area of 2 pi rho dr. And that's actually a faster way of doing the problem. But we're just going to do it the straightforward, long way of doing it. OK, so what are we trying to do? We are trying to calculate. Let me keep my figure. I don't need to remind me of how cylindrical polar coordinates work. We've already written them down. and used it for this particular application. I'm just having a little bit more technical problem. So I'm going to avoid this problem entirely. Just ignore that. OK, so the electrostatic potential of V is just going to be a surface integral of dq over 4 pi epsilon naught r 
And here the surface is my uniformly charged disk. This is going to be sigma divided by four pi epsilon naught. Those are constants. The numerator is going to have rho, d rho, d phi in it. And the denominator is just going to be rho squared plus z squared to the one half power. I can turn this two dimensional integral into a one, into a one dimensional integral by just integrating out the azimuthal dependence. So I'll integrate out phi. And I'll just get rho d rho in the numerator. And I'll get rho squared plus z squared quantity to the one half power in the denominator. Um, I should say something here. On the previous problems, I went through the trouble of using prime coordinates, a uh, prime variable, prime variables to show when I was dealing with a source charge distribution. I did that only when there's a possibility of confusion in doing the mathematics. So generally, I try not to use that convention unless I need to show the reader that way, wake up, then something is different going on here. Something different is going on here. That's not going to be the case here. Okay. So this is the integral I need to evaluate, and I need to evaluate it over a distance. I need to evaluate it over rho. So let's get rid of my figure for the moment. Because all that's left here is mathematics. So let's perform a change in variables. Let us define a dummy variable u, which will be rho squared plus z squared. You'll see in a minute why that's useful. du is just going to be 2 times rho d rho. Now you can see why that's a useful selection or choice. The numerator is going to go like rho d rho, so you can replace that by something that's proportional to du. And the denominator, you can replace that by something that looks like u to the one half power. So you're going to get an integral that's much simpler to grasp with. You still have to do a change in variables for the limits of integration. So rho goes from the center of the disk to its radius a. u, my dummy variable, from my change in variables formula here, has to go from z squared to z squared plus a squared. So you have to get the mathematics right. You have to follow the steps or the path that the mathematics is leading you to, because that'll give you, that'll lead you to the right physical example. If you make a mistake in the mathematics, um, nine times out of 10, we well, certainly are gonna get a wrong answer physically, and hopefully the physical answer you get will be unphysical on the certain limiting cases. So that will tell you, wait a minute, you've got, you've made a mistake somewhere. You need to go back. Mistakes are useful. Okay. And in ways, there are ways of checking for mistakes. And one way a mistake is useful is that once you make it the first time, you're not going to make it again. Okay. So I'm ready to make this change in variables or change up variable. There's only one variable that I'm changing in this particular problem. So the electrostatic potential at the point zero, zero, Z, due to this uniformly charged disk of uniform surface charge density sigma and radius A, is going to be sigma surface charge density divided by two times the permittivity of free space. And I'm going to have an integral that goes from z squared to z squared plus a squared of one half 
du u to the one half power. Note u is never zero, or it's unphysical. Yeah, it's, it's unphysical. If u were zero, rho and z were zero, and you really wouldn't be able to find an expression for the electrostatic potential mathematically. We may say more about that later, but that's a subtle point. Okay, I claim that this integral is an elementary integral. We could have evaluated this back in lecture one or two. And I'll leave it up to you to show that the electrostatic potential anywhere along that axis z is sigma divided by two epsilon naught times a quantity in square, bra square brackets z squared plus a squared to the one half power minus z squared to the one half power. And so that's my final result for the electrostatic potential along an axis of that intersects the center of my uniformly charged disk or radius A. But not so fast, I've got to simplify this. I've got to take those square roots. And if I want to take those square roots, again, I have to be careful. So again, let's write down the answer. I can just say that V is a function of Z because X and Y are always zero. This is going to be sigma divided by 2 epsilon naught z squared plus a squared to the 1 half power minus z squared to the 1 half power. So same story. We saw this in the previous two examples this afternoon. If we take positive square root. In this example, we'll get a physically meaningful result. Right? The square root of z squared is just positive z. That implies that z is positive. So we'll get a result for the electrostatic potential. It's just z squared plus a squared entire quantity to the one half power minus z. And this is going to be true if you two are if you are to the right of that charged circular disk if z is positive. Now in this case you actually can take the negative square root and get a physically meaningful result. Maybe you'll get an answer for the electrostatic potential as a function of z. But you replace the square root of z squared by a minus z. And that minus z is going to turn the original minus sign to a plus sign. And this expression is going to be valid if you are to the left of the charged disk, uniformly charged disk of radius A. Okay. And clearly, again, we talk about limiting cases, check what happens when Z is zero. For both cases, one and two, you get the same results. So symmetry says it doesn't matter whether you're on well front side of the, of the disk or the bottom side of the disk, the electrostatic potential is going to be the same. And this little gimmick here saves you. So let's conclude by looking at some nice limiting cases to see if this expression makes sense.
maybe I should have said some limiting cases. Well, we already looked at one. If Z is zero, then in fact, the electrostatic potential is just sigma A divided by two epsilon naught. So how about the limiting case where Z is much, much greater than A? So you're very, very far away from the slit charge disk. So I will give this to you as a problem for problem set nine. And this will be an example of an extremely useful technique from calculus known as the Taylor series. So you will be able to show doing a Taylor series expansion that this result for the electrostatic potential will be exactly what it should be for a point charge. Where there is a Z at the denominator. So this is the limiting case for a point charge. So that's good. So I'm not sure if this is a limiting case. Well, it is. I'm going to ask you to use these results to calculate the electric field in those two regimes when Z is greater than zero. And I'm also going to ask you to calculate the electric field for that charge disk when Z is less than zero. And these are limiting cases. So And these are limiting cases we have previously seen. And I will give these tasks to you to perform in problem set nine, which again should be online in the Google Drive site probably by early Tuesday morning at the latest. It could be there before then. Okay, so let's summarize. Why is the electrostatic potential potential helpful? Well, it's helpful because it allows you to find the electric field for a problem by just taking minus the gradient of the electrostatic potential and what we have looked at in a number of examples. We've done three today in lecture, and we've done maybe five last lecture. And there are a number of examples in the problem sets. So let's make this a clearer statement. Calculating the electrostatic potential is always much easier than finding the electric field directly, much easier to have. Finding the electric field in a problem involves doing an integral over a discrete or continuous charge distribution and you have 
vector components to worry about. You have those pesky R hats and R position vectors to worry about. This is hard. It's doable. We've done it, but it's hard. Much easier to just simply calculate the electrostatic potential, where all you need to do is evaluate R and DQ. No vector components, no R hats, no I hats, no J hats, uh, K hats, no R hats, no theta hats, no P hats. Okay. All right, so um, let me give you an idea of where we're going next for lecture 10. We are going to say a bit more about the electrostatic potential in terms of why it's useful in vector calculus and give it a little bit more of a foundational support and we're going to introduce the idea of work and energy in electrostatics so we'll look at the problem of electrostatic potential and electrostatic energy so again problem set eight the solution key actually is in google drive as we speak uh problem set eight was posted actually last sunday in the Google Drive. Problem set nine will be available no later than uh, probably Tuesday morning of next week. And um, problem set uh, or lecture 10 next week, we'll start talking about the idea of work in energy in electrostatics. So again, um, from my perspective today, uh, we really have three more lectures on electrostatics. We'll talk about electrostatic potential, electrostatic energy, lecture 10. We may actually also start talking about electric dipoles, another useful application in electrostatics. Lecture 11, we'll say a little bit more about electro, electric dipoles. And we'll start talking about the very first important device that comes out of all of this, a particular application. And that is the idea of a capacitor. So we need to talk about capacitance. Lecture 12, um, there are various schools of thoughts schools of thought on this. Um, we could have talked about the divergence theorem in vector calculus, and we could have talked about Stokes theorem in vector calculus earlier. And that would have been in the context of just talking about them in just in terms of general vector fields. Now that we've got some familiarity with the electric field, and electrostatic potential, and electrostatics, we can go back and revisit these ideas of curl, divergence, gradient, flux, in terms of real physical fields, particularly electric field. So we'll have a discussion with divergence theorem and Stokes theorem in lecture 12. And I promised in the initial advertisement of the course, we would say something about magnetism. Um, so I'm including a 13th and final lecture, which will give a very brief introduction to magnetostatics and why vector calculus is important. Okay, so that ends today's lecture, lecture nine. Questions or comments?